working with uh, various traffic safety partners for over 10 years and uh, more so I've been working with crash data for I think since the moment I stepped foot in this place uh, and it, that was an interesting experience just because I stepped in and some strange guy I never met said you, you want to work with safety data and having just started and needing a job I was like okay so um, I got head deep into it and so this is part of my world um, I had no idea, you know, at first I thought I was just playing with numbers and then I, you know, in looking at what it is that I've been working with in regards to these numbers, it's far greater than that. Traffic safety tends not to be the sexiest topic in the world because, of course, everyone here is, you know, we are one of the greatest drivers in this room. I mean, I don't think anyone here will admit to being a terrible driver. And uh, so often we don't think about traffic safety, but why should we think about it? Well, in this region, the Houston Galveston area, we have over 100,000 serious incidents a year. This is where there is a fatality, a serious injury, or potentially um, a great deal of property damage to a vehicle, where at least it's over $1,000, which today actually isn't too much because as I found out, that uh, even the bumper cover that comes off my car because I got dented, uh, that's a $600 fix, oddly enough. So, but it's over $100,000 uh, 100,000 incidents a year in this region. Almost 600 people die on our roads every year in the area. It's over 3,000 for the state of Texas every year and over 16,000 serious injuries. And this is serious injuries where someone is taken out on an ambulance because they're incapacitated or there's something obviously wrong, like a broken arm, a broken leg. Um, essentially, by the time you leave here, if starting when I just got started, tell you time to leave, probably three people have gotten seriously injured on our roadways. Another big issue, you know, we talk about transportation. The biggest issue here is congestion. We got to cure congestion. Crashes is one of the biggest causes of congestion. You got two cars connecting in the middle of the road, it's backing up traffic. How do you cure congestion? Stop crashing the middle of the road. It'll take care of at least 25% of your issues in regards to congestion. Also, and we have some law enforcement here, it puts a strain on folks like law enforcement, the fire department, EMS, doctors, um, various folks who have to address an incident every time it occurs. That's your tax dollars at work. That's your tax dollars you're gonna be paying the more crashes go up. And also your insurance costs. The more crashes you have in an area, the more your insurance costs. Go to an area that has fewer crashes, your insurance rates will be far less. Why else? Why is traffic safety important? It costs our region money. The National Safety Council has a whole methodology, methodology for estimating the cost of unintentional injuries, including car crashes. And we're looking at things like the cost of productivity, the cost of insurance, uh, hospital stays, uh, follow-ups, et cetera. These are the total costs for our region based on what occurred in 2013, you saw the breakdown. About 5.3 billion with a B dollars a year it costs our region. We often every year, uh, Texas A&M Transportation Institute comes out with a study that talks about the cost of congestion. We're very, we're very interested in the cost of congestion on our region. That figure is only 3.1 million. And you gotta figure that some of that congestion cost is right there. So this is a serious issue that actually has economic impact on our region as a whole. This is one of my favorite graphs. Why we, why we need to talk about traffic safety. How many of y'all have a gun in the home to protect yourself? It's all right, it's Texas, you're allowed. <laughs> Odds are you're gonna get killed on the highway before you get killed by someone in your home. And this is what shows it. Um, it's, it's something that we're, you know, we have a lot of focus on being safe in our own homes. We, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, safety is about making sure that our, 
our family's not assaulted, our homes aren't burglarized, that we're not murdered or robbed. But truth be told, it's also what's going on on the road. And I gotta tell you that uh, law enforcement, this is a big deal for law enforcement too because, and I have my law enforcement representative over here from the Sheriff's Department. I think you can tell me that uh, in regards to where the money goes towards, in terms of what gets pro um, you know, looked after and what's mo most important in regards to law enforcement and, and where we put our resources, you want your cop there to protect your home, to protect your family, to protect your businesses. But this same cop, this cop pulls you over for doing 15 over in, on the freeway. This is the agent of the devil right here. <laughs> Raise your hand, sir. He is one of Satan's million, minions. And it's unfortunate because while he might be causing you some aggravation and grief, He's saving me and my family from that individual plowing into me. But our resources aren't necessarily geared towards this, but it's still a very serious situation. This is one that's close to my heart, and it's up there with that red box, was slightly ovalized, is that crashes will most likely be the reason why your kids die. And my kids fall into that range. Is that I have to be most concerned about whether or not they get killed in a car crash. And uh, you know, we talk about the things that you know, I'm not to terribly concerned about some of these other things happen to my kid, but I buckle them in and I want to make sure that they are safe. So what does this look like for our area? Car crashes in our area, it's been interesting. We actually were experiencing a downward trend for quite a while. And then all of a sudden, over the last two years, it's gone up, and not just gone up, gone up significantly. Since 2011, car crashes went up 25%. I'd love to be able to exactly tell you why. I can only narrow it down to three reasons at this, at this point. One, we had a bit of an economic downslide, and people drove less due to it. We have the data that show that you know, people were driving less, there were fewer vehicle miles traveled, fewer vehicle miles traveled, less opportunity to get into a crash. Second, also in economic bad times, we tend to be a little more cautious. Perhaps we are being a little more safe. And things are getting better for a lot of us, so maybe we're kind of letting go of some of this. The third issue is that, frankly, there, is, there has been some developments in terms of uh, crash reporting, that there are new systems out there that make it easier to report incidents. Um, it used to be that officers have to fill out this ungodly report called the CR3. How many of you filled out? Too many. <laughs> um, it is a pain. Uh, now it's on, it's on their systems in, in their, uh, in their uh, squad cars, uh, and there are some systems that even download, once it's into the system at the agency, it downloads straight into text.system, system, which is where I get all my data from. Is this better reporting? That might be it as well. We have to keep an eye on the trends, because this, these are the data that we are working with. And I can't modify the data necessarily, but this may shape what our future looks like in terms of how we choose to respond to a lot of these issues. And this is gonna be a big deal when we, it comes to dealing with policy in our area because as the federal government is looking at doing, we are potentially gonna have to keep track of how crashes improve or how crash rates improve or decline and be willing to deal with this. In terms of regionally, how it looks in regards to how we're all effective, on average about 585 people a year are killed in, crash, in crashes in our region. And it just fluctu it fluctuates. This is actually a good trend to some degree because oddly enough, fatalities are somewhat random events. 
because there are a lot of these fatalities that potentially did not need to happen. One in four of these fatalities were people not wearing their seat belts. If they were wearing their seat belts, they perhaps would not show up. That's something that's easily addressed. Um, you know, it could be a matter of how the car was hit. You know, if you get hit in the, in the back, heck a lot safer than if you're hitting the side. You know, 55 miles an hour impact in, in the rear is far safer than it's going to be on the side of your car. Um, but it's pretty stable. Yes, sir? Is there a reason why the Vitalis don't seem to emulate the uh, previous slide? This is pretty A couple reasons. One, vehicles are getting safer. They are getting safer. So we are able to survive certain impacts. And second, there's a there is a level of randomness to it. It's, there could be sheer luck, frankly, sheer luck. If you get the right set of circumstances where everyone gets hit right in your driver's side door at 60 miles per hour, I guarantee you this number will go up exponentially. There is an aspect, drive, crashes tend to be random events. Nobody gets up and plans a crash. They happen. There are circumstances that play into it. But this is a good sign, and I will give a lot of credit to this, in regards to this, is that cars are a lot safer. The same thing goes with serious injuries. If you'll notice, the trends here, they, don't, they fluctuate a little bit. But they're not going down terribly, they're not going up terribly. It's just that there is, there is a series of um, events that occur and depending on the situation, be it the, the uh, nature of the crash that, you know, there are some years more people get injured and some years people don't. This slide, though, is the most telling one. Is how many crashes are property damage only. And this is going up in regards to your question. And I think this is perhaps, I'd like to just show you a very quick video. This is one of my... For the 50th anniversary of the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety, uh, they took a 2009 Malibu, which was standard mid-cycle car for the day and put it up against a 1959 Chevy Bel Air which was the standard mid-sized car of the day and what they did was they basically did a offside head-on crash where both drivers would get impacted this is the f inside the 59 the driver is essentially in the back seat I was about to say the tr real tragedy of this video is that they ruined a perfectly beautiful 1959 Bel Air. <laughs> Do you know how fast they were going? Uh, I believe this is a 35 mile per hour crash. Now this is inside of the 2009. He hit the airbag, as it's designed to do. The front end was not in the best of shape, but this is how far things have come. We think about older cars as being heavier, you know, behemoths of steel, but the truth is it's not the weight of the car, it's the design of the car that has made them a lot safer. Uh, the invention of crumple zones, um, various uh, improvements in bumper, oddly enough you have to thank NASCAR for some of this. Um, but this is a positive trend that despite an increase in crashes, there are more and more that's only damage to the car, and that's a good thing. In regards to how we're dealing with this, though, because this is a huge problem, too many facets, and there's what in safety they have, it's called the four E's. It used to be three E's, and now there's a fourth E, which is emergency management. And the th four E's are engineering, enforcement, education, and as I mentioned, emergency management. Traditionally, um, 
when traffic safety comes into play, the thought is that there is an engineering issue at hand. And I have my friends over here in the corner that remind me this every day, almost, as they call me looking for information about various intersections. I'm assuming you get a phone call of some sort saying that, you know, I have the most deadliest intersection outside of my subdivision. Tell me how many crashes there are. That there is an engineering fix to this. And truth be told, there are some cases that engineering is appropriate. Um, it's possible that there is a pro problem with road configuration. Um, perhaps traffic signals are slightly out of whack that uh, the yellows are too short. Perhaps there's inappropriate signage. Uh, uh, perhaps there's uh, insufficient pedestrian bicycle infrastructure available. You know, engineering plays a part in fixing some of this. And this is, it's critical and, you know, and it's something that is highly focused on. But, as I have my engineers in the room, I will ask them. You all, your PEs, I, I've worked with these gentlemen for a very long time. I know they are perfectly capable engineers. I would ask them to design my intersection any day of the week, year or month. Um, can you design me a perfect intersection that will prevent two people from colliding? <laughs> Get working on it. <laughs> As I like to say, design me a perfect intersection, I'll find you two perfect idiots who will find a way to collide in it. That's the problem. Some of it, there's engineering, but there's a lot of human error involved. A lot of human error involved. In fact, if you looked at the vast majority of crash da data, there's something called a contributing factor. And it's a factor where that is about why was why this crash occur? And it, you'll see a whole list of things: running a red light, speeding, drinking, uh, using your cell phone. I mean, there's a whole list of them, and almost every single crash that I have has a contributing factor that suggests human error. You give me a traffic signal that has a two-second yellow instead of a three. That car that catches that two-second yellow might have to hit its brakes so it doesn't get in the intersection and cause a crash. You might have an engineering issue there. The person that slams into that individual wasn't paying attention to the person ahead. That's a behavioral issue. Now granted, there's only so much that can be done by changing that to a three-second yellow. But the person behind me isn't paying attention. That's where the problem lies. And a lot of the crashes, that's what's going on, is that it's someone behind who isn't necessarily on top of the situation if, if something sudden happens that cannot control for the situation. So we have other things that we need to look at for fixing it. There's enforcement. Enforcement is key. We need enforcement out there for, you know, we have speeders, we have people running red lights, we have drunk drivers. Um, you know, but in order to make that truly, truly effective, whatever our police force is now, multiply it by what? Two, three, four? In order to keep it all safe. It's extremely costly. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. I got, I got this, uh, in fact, these last two weekends, I have a DWI task force that had 17 agencies out there looking for drunk drivers. That's great. They operate eight weekends out of a 52 weekend year. Um, so I got 44 weekends that I can't necessarily account for that, you know, there will be folks out there drinking, driving out, and necessarily have the folks out there enforcing. Um, and they're, you know, law enforcement, they're out there, they're doing a host of things. They might be looking for drunks. They're getting cats out of trees too. They're stopping burglaries. They're preventing family members from getting assaulted. So, I mean, they have a lot on their plate already, but enforcement is gonna be key making this happen because one of the things in order to make this easier and make us safer is to make it more difficult to do. Education's a big part of it too. If we start teaching folks on the early side, you know, it's taken a long time to get folks to realize that drinking and driving is a bad thing. Wearing seatbelts is a good thing. Um, why did it take so long? I have no idea. But educating folks 
is critical to it. I educate my kids right from the get-go. Lord knows, my neck bothers me whenever I back out of a driveway. So I don't put my belt on, and I know I'm taping this, okay, I'm guilty. I don't put my belt on until I am backed out of the driveway because frankly, it kills my neck. And my daughter gives me grief about it every single time. She's seven. That's when you gotta get them because it's not just, I can put out programs. I have, I have programs that I work with uh, that works with high school students, try to get them educated about um, safe driving as teenagers. Um, there are various programs out there that driving schools have, but one of the biggest educators out there is us, as parents, and that we teach them right from the get-go, they emulate us. Emergency management, that's the fourth thing, that's the new one they threw in because a lot of this is about usually the aftermath of an incident and uh, some of this is about when an incident occurs it's critical to get that incident cleared as fast as possible because the longer you have it out there the more you back up traffic and you have the potential of having a secondary crash especially on the freeways because you got traffic slowing to a halt on the freeway and you got someone coming over a hill and doesn't see the backup at 60 miles an hour, it, it's a recipe for disaster. I'd like to get into quickly, as fast as possible, some of the issues that we need to look at in regards to various aspects of traffic crashes in our region. Because, I mean, there are so many different issues that we have to look at and so many different issues. It's not just a matter of, you know, two cars connecting. There are various factors that get into it. And so I'd like to go over the various issues that we're experiencing, you know, in regards to traffic safety in our region. Alcohol-related crashes, perhaps one of the most noted uh, issues in our area. Harris County, unfortunately, is number one in regards to DWI deaths in the country. Um, we're about the same size as Chicago, and we, uh, I think we're four to one in regards to DWI deaths. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, how far we, even, even Los Angeles County, which has three times the amount of people as, uh, as Harris County practically, we still top them in regards to DWI deaths. Thankfully, alcohol-related crashes seem to be going down. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that there are a lot of agencies that are taking this very seriously. They're out there on, on the weekends. The uh, district attorney has no refusal weekends where if you get uh, caught for a DWI and you refuse to blow, they'll take you downtown and they'll draw your blood. They'll get a warrant and draw your blood. It's becoming much more uh, put out there that drinking and driving is not acceptable and perhaps folks are starting to listen. Alcohol-related fatalities, you're looking at about four of every 10 crashes involves alcohol where a fatality is involved. If people just didn't drink and drive, these could possibly go away. I mean, it's, it's, it's rather insane. It's terribly unfortunate, but four of 10 involve alcohol. And the average offender has a, a blood alcohol limit over twice the legal limit, 0.08 is the legal limit, so to speak. And you have to figure that it's not one margarita, it's probably close to three. It's five beers. Um, and that's just the mean and the median, which just happen to be the same. All these bars that go beyond that, there are people who are doing three times, four times, in some cases even five times the legal limit and somehow surviving that, I have no idea how. In regards to drunk driving issues though, and there are a lot of them, one, there is a, essentially a DWI defense industry I'd say out there. How many of you have heard a commercial on the radio that says, basically, have you murdered your neighbor lately? robbed a convenience store, set someone's house on fire, assaulted a family member. Maybe you're just being misunderstood. And really, you need us to help you out. You never hear that commercial on the radio 
But Lord knows if you have a drink, there are a host of folks out there who are willing to help you get off from this. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. Um, and, you know, because of that, because of all this, evidence becomes critical in regards to these cases. My friend here with the badge and the gun, it takes hours to process a DWI. Your standard car crash will take what? Maybe half an hour to process? Average DWI? Two hours. He's got it good. Folks on my DWI task force, it's three, four, five hours, depending how many folks are out there to draw blood or to process the paperwork if it's a real busy night. Four or five hours, potentially, to process a DWI. But yeah, two hours, it's, you know, they have it, that means you have it down to a science. It, it's the, the, the amount of paperwork compared to any other crime is, is it's, it's a little ludicrous, frankly. But this is what has to happen in order to ensure that this case is gonna get prosecuted accordingly. One of the big issues that helps play into this, though, is something called a Uniform Accident and Sickness Policy Provision Law. You've all heard of that, right? No? Okay, we call it UPPL. It's an odd little archaic law that was put into effect that basically said that if you are caught, if you come into the, into the hospital and you have been in a uh, car crash, and it is determined that you have alcohol in your system, an insurance company does not necessarily have to pay for your hospital bills. The people who actually put that law into effect, and this was years ago, maybe almost 50 years ago, think that this law is silly and should be repealed. Texas has not repealed this law. Now, why is this an issue here? Is because one of the things that could happen is that if I, if as an officer, you have a DWI suspect and you want to take them into a blood draw, there's only probably, outside the county jail, there's only two places you can take them to get the draw, Ben Taub and LBJ. Two hospitals. Why? Because St. Luke's, Memorial Hermann, um, you know, name some of the other private hospitals. There's concern there that they will not get reimbursed. So they will not necessarily participate in getting a blood draw. The other two are public hospitals. They have to take you anyway. This, this law needs to be repealed. This is causing some problems in terms of prosecuting cases. Something that I was talking about offside is that frankly, we are a region that's heavily reliant on the car. I talk about other places, New York City, Chicago. They have far lower drunk driving rates, drunk driving deaths, because they're not necessarily as reliant on the car. We are reliant on the car. If we want to get a drink, odds are we got to get in the car. The closest establishment to me that serves alcohol is, let me rephrase that. The closest establishment that I actually want to step foot in that serves alcohol <laughs> is two miles away from me. So I could drive, I can walk there, which would take probably about a good hour or so, or I can drive there and get there in about eight minutes. And if I have two margaritas and they are strong margaritas, then I gotta drive home or take a cab. Well, if you've driven there, a lot of people will drive home. They just will. We rely on that car. This way this region is set up, the reliance is there. It almost, I would say, puts us in a position where we have to make this decision. And it's unfortunate because there are times that often we decide wrong. It's an inconvenience. We should be getting a cab. We should have someone come and pick us up. But too many people will say, well, I'm here. I have my car. I'm going to drive home. Again, we have some DWI task forces, no refusal recent weekends out there. I think they are actually making a difference. I really do. I hope these will continue to be funded because the more, more that's out there, more folks out there, they know that we're watching you. I think people are going to be more careful about it. The hip happening, next topic, the hip happening issue of the day, distracted driving because this, this is the one where you know, we all now have these handy little gadgets here and um, 
it's 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 the drunk driving you know where drunk driving was in the early 80s it's what distracted driving is today this this is the traffic safety topic du jour crashes oddly enough according to this are going down and maybe slightly going up and that might be in line with uh, with how crashes are going up in general um, yes Well, I'm going to actually get into this data set in a minute because there's something a little odd about, it's not odd about this, it's, it's actually a major issue in regards to this data set because all my data, uh, it's from one of my first slide, this comes from crash reports that are done from law enforcement officers who have to write up these reports. Um, and there are some serious data issues that play into this and I will get into that in a minute. Um, but before I do, one thing I want to look at here is who by age causes distracted driving. A lot of the focus is about young folks, uh, teenagers, because you know all teenagers do is text. That's all they do. Morning, noon, night, in the car, during breakfast, that's all they do. And so the perception is, well, they are the problem. They are a problem. Well, if you look beyond this 16 to 20 age racket, there are a lot of other people who are causing the problem too, and probably at all of our age groups. So this isn't just a teenager problem, this is an all of us problem. And what are the distractions we're looking at? They're all over the place. They're the phone calls, texting, eating, drinking, uh, your passenger, in my case, my children, um, people trying to shave, put on makeup, um, reading books and newspapers, which is an odd one because there was a study done that said that texting is more dangerous than reading your newspaper in your car. I'm not quite sure how they came to that conclusion because I'm pretty sure both are equally a huge, uh, hugely bad idea. Um, even the radio to some degree is a distraction. The thing about distracted driving, and this is a little different from a lot of other aspects of driving, is that there are three types of distraction. This is not to imply that it's just women drivers who putting on their makeup is the cause of distracted driving because men cause more crashes than women. I was going to throw that slide up there and give that to you, you know, that you take home for all your husbands that say, you know, women drivers is a problem. No, it's not. It's men drivers. So, but these are the three issues in regards to distraction. It's three different kinds. There's a visual distraction where you should be keeping your eyes on the road. There's a manual distraction, you should have your hands on the wheel. And a cognitive one where your brain should be thinking about what's going on ahead. When you, when you text, you're doing neither of the three. Because one, who do I got? I got four, I got four messages. Okay, so I'm here, I'm looking at my stuff, and I'm not looking at you, my hand is not on a wheel, or if it is on the wheel, it doesn't really matter because I have no idea where I'm stealing, steering. And I'm more concerned about the fact that um, the TIP subcommittee meeting has been canceled apparently on March 18th. So that being said, uh, driving down the freeway in the five or six seconds that I've told you that, uh, I've traveled two football fields. Two football fields. It's about 600 feet. Um, so much can happen in two football fields. Lord knows who you'll plow into in two football fields. Texting and driving, cell phone use and driving, this is what, this is where you got all three things that you are not in any way, shape, or form in touch with what you're doing. Even drunk drivers, they may be drunk, but there's a better chance that their hand is on the wheel and they're doing their darndest to look out for traffic to make sure they don't hit anybody. This is far worse than drunk driving. I'm not condoning drunk driving. I'm just saying this really needs to be taken a look at. And what are the issues in regards to drunk driving? It's not crime. There's no law about drunk driving. I mean, there are some ordinances in certain cities that say you can't, uh, did I say drunk driving? I mean distracted driving. But it is not a crime yet. I mean, in West U and Bel Air, you're not allowed to text. Okay, that's fine. 
but you can see you think you can do it in the rest of uh, the rest of Harris County and a lot of other places in the area um, so if I'm texting and I crash into someone what are you gonna what are you gonna get me for maybe reckless driving but truth is um, it's that's gonna even be hard to second item this goes to your question the data are potentially unreliable why it has a lot to do with crash reporting because if I run into the back of somebody and I'm texting and driving the first thing I do is I put my phone in my pocket and officer friendly will come and ask me you know is there a problem why did you run into them sorry sir I uh, you know I my kid was in the back seat he was he was making a noise or something um, he's not going to ask for my cell phone or he could but my response response is going to be you got a warrant for that now he's not going to get a warrant for that because if he needed to get a warrant for everyone suspected of potentially texting and driving we would have to elect <coughs> probably twice as many judges as we currently have just to process warrants for cell phones. This isn't going to happen anytime soon. So odds are what's being reported, unless you are admitting that you were distracted or on your cell phone, it's not going to be reported in the data. So the data I showed you, unfortunately, is most likely incomplete. But you can tell by looking at some of the information where there are a bunch of people just running into the back of people randomly and about 30% of incidents, people running in the back of somebody. Odds are, there's a distraction going on, it's just not being discussed. And more so, there, there are distractions that are actually getting integrated into our cars. We have now, you know, we have the DVD players, we have satellite radio, we got, oh, sorry. Um, how many of you seen the Tesla S, Model S? The new electric car, Tesla Model S. Anyone see one? It is one of the most beautiful cars in the world. I think it is gorgeous. Um, I would love to have one. It comes with a 17 inch display that the driver can see, right, in, right between the driver and the passenger. 17 inches, which is about the size of a computer monitor. It's bigger than an iPad. You can drive down the freeway and read the New York Times as you go. That's, getting, that's the future. That's what's being integrated in our cars right now. So, I mean, this stuff is just going into our cars. And now also, the public, frankly, is going to have its limits on what can be restricted. There's a lot of talk about restricting texting and driving. That's becoming more and more acceptable. Hands, uh, using cell phones, handheld cell phones, there's a little more uh, more of an issue with that but it's stuff that it's an issue that some folks are actually saying well maybe we maybe we can live with that but there's even discussion because of the cognitive factions of, of distracted driving that frankly that hands-free cell phone use should be restricted as yet as well and odds are the public will not go for that so these are certain, some of the things that are going to impact distracted driving and the ability to actually enforce it and make it safer for us. Speeding, it's real simple. Don't speed. Speed-related crashes, they are going down. That is kind of a good thing. Um, I, I think part of it is that, and frankly, uh, two, two reasons. One, I think the economy got bad and people were being a little more conservative on gas, but also, it's not going up that fast, and frankly, I think part of it is congestion's getting a little worse. The nice thing about congestion, it prevents speeding. <laughs> because you can't really go, you know, it's hard to go 60 miles per hour when prevailing speed is 25. Now here's the thing. Speed is about a quarter of all fatalities. Now this is an interesting graph, because what you see is this dark blue here with the white numbers are crashes where it was excessive speed or over the speed limit, or, or speeding um, beyond what can just conditions entail. Like, it, speed limit can be t 60, you're doing 45, but really you should only be doing 25. That's what the lower blue is. 
but up at the top is the total. And there's a series of crashes which are listed as a failure to control speed. Those are, these are hard crashes. These are crashes where basically a, if law enforcement pulls up onto a wreck and you have two cars, they are grossly mangled. One of them's on fire. Um, obviously a horrible collision has occurred. Were they speeding? Well, I think according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, I don't think you can tell because I think you can tell whether something is in motion or you can't tell where, where the location is. Well, you know where the location is, but you can't tell whether the thing is or was in motion. That's my corollary to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there are a series of crashes where inexplicably there's just exceptional amount of damage or death in this case where Odds are this was not, these crashes in the lighter blue were not someone going 10 miles an hour and running into the back of somebody. There was some extreme event that occurred. Odds are it had to involve speed considering the level of th that death occurred in this case. One way to deal with it, frankly, it's gonna be more enforcement. One option that was put out there was speed detection units. Oddly enough, the first one put out there was in Friendswood. They reduced speeding, they reduce uh, police presence. Um, there were some issues with it. Who's liable? If I'm driving your car and I speed, do I get the ticket or do you get the ticket? Well, odds are you get the ticket, but you know, and that's gonna be a problem between me and you. Um, is it an invasion of privacy? You see me go by a certain spot, that way you know where I am. That's an invasion of privacy. Is this a revenue generator? It might be. Truth is, these things are great, but they'll never happen here in Texas. And that's unfortunate because these are extremely effective in terms of reducing speed. Red light cameras, it's a similar situation. The crashes, you know, they're, they're on the decline as well and they're starting to increase. But, you know, in terms of these years going down, um, the decline, that was the time when actually Houston had uh, red light cameras in place. They were taken out back in, what was it, 2010, 2011? Um, you know, hopefully it's that people kind of got the message and kind of laid off on the red light running, but there was, there was shown that uh, red light cameras actually did reduce crashes. Um, but, you know, they were taken out. Um, it, the c citizens of Houston or whoever came out to vote that day decided that they did not want them. They were then removed. Truth is, you reduce police presence with these things. You can have folks station officer at every single intersection, or you can put these devices out there. They are effective in reducing these crashes. The big, one of the biggest issues that were brought up about these is that they do increase rear end crashes. The reason why they increase rear end crashes, the reason why they increase rear end crashes is because if you just see the sign, you might, you might run into the end, you know, you might stop quickly because you're not prepared to deal with the situation. And so someone checks up on the brakes too, up, too quickly and someone plows into the back of them. That's usually one of the excuses that, you know, people who are against red light cameras, that they, they cite that increases these crashes. Again, this is where the person behind has to just be more careful about, you know, how they're driving. The whole invasion of privacy issue, the re re revenue generation issue, that also comes into play again as well. This is one of the biggest issues cited. In regards to the revenue generation, my, my view of this is always to promote civil disobedience. That if you sincerely believe that this is a revenue generator, speed cameras, red light cameras, and you want to deny the city their money, don't speed and don't run red lights. And that's the way you stick it to the man. Because essentially you are, you are denying them what they think you want them from them. It's not gonna cause me any heartache. Young drivers, this is a big deal. Look at this, this young lady who just got her driver's license and her father in the background, he's slightly blurred out because you can't see the sweat pouring down his brow as he's <laughs> praying for his life. Um, Young drivers, these crashes are starting to decline overall. They're starting to go up. I'm not sure if there's a trend there that's corresponding with the increase in crashes overall. But 
you know, there, something about young driver crashes that they're responsible. There are only 7% of the population young drivers, 16, 20. They're responsible for one in six crashes, serious crashes in the area. Um, they're responsible for one in eight fatalities. And over 60% of those fatalities is the young driver in question. And one of the big things here, I'm sorry, for teenagers who, well, there's no teenagers here. Teenage brains aren't developed. They've pretty much shown that the human brain fully develops by 25, especially the part of the brain that involves decision making. I know kids think they're infallible and they can do no wrong and they can make the ultimate decisions, but they're not quite great on decision making. And so this has an impact in regards to you know, how they are on the road. Now in regards to certain improvements for young drivers, you know, the state has uh, put in graduate driver's licenses, which kind of ramps young drivers up in regards to when they can hit the road, how many people they can have in the car, and the hours they can drive. Um, they've changed parent-taught driver's ed, where now the um, parents who want to teach their kids have to follow a certain curriculum. It used to be I could just get in the car with the kid and say, you know, hit it, Chewy, and you know, we'd be off and you know, hopefully they'll figure out how to drive. And uh, despite how well we drive, we probably don't drive as good as we think we do and uh, I might be the last person who should be teaching my kids to drive, even though I do claim to be a parallel parking ninja. Um, the economy is also another issue about young drivers and part of the reason why perhaps they're not driving as much. Because oddly enough, they're not driving as much. Because it costs a lot of money to own a car, it costs a lot of money to insure a car, and with the changes in the job market, it's hard for younger people to find jobs, even part-time jobs. So there isn't a lot of in disposable income for young drivers to drive. So this is actually having, we think, an impact on young drivers. And the odd thing though, the fact that I mentioned that they don't necessarily want to drive blows my mind. Because there have been studies done where they've shown that there's actually a growing lack of interest. They're more interested in texting friends than they are actually getting in their car. Well, I was 16, February 19th, 1985. First thing I did was I woke my mother up. We drove down the DMV. It opened at 8 o'clock. I went and got my license. I took my test. They decided I passed. I drove home. I slowed the car down. I kicked my mother out of the car. I drove off to the record store. I got my free record. I got my free, this is when the LPs were still there. Um, I got my free car wash and I got, uh, I think, an ice cream or something. that You get free ice cream on your birthday. I was ready to drive from the day I was born. Part of it is I grew up in Detroit. I got a nephew. He had to be cajoled into driving at 18. The interest is not as prevalent. So it's kind of interesting, but this is where it all starts. The young driver when they learn to drive. Elderly drivers on the other end of the spectrum. This is a trend that's going upwards. Um, elderly drivers. There aren't that many in regards to crashes. Less than 5%, 6% of the fatalities, but a lot of fatalities are the elderly driver, as well as a you know, majority of the injuries. A lot of it is that when an elderly driver gets into an incident, even with safety features in the car, impacts can be more damaging than on younger folks. It's just it's, it's just a factor of growing old. Um, in regards to the ability to drive, reflexes are slower, vision is impaired. Um, my father's 73. He's healthy as a horse. He is. He goes to the gym every day. Um, unfortunately, we had to take his keys away from him. Um, he started developing something called Lewy body dementia. He wasn't able to necessarily focus as well. Um, and because of that, Essentially, we had to take his car keys away. He was not able to drive like he used to. It's unfortunate, and truly, it's gonna be a growing situation here. Regionally, according to the State Data Center, the population over 65 is going to be increasing either four or five fold over the next 40 years. More elderly drivers out there. And this is something that, despite how old we get, these are factors, though, that are going to play into this. This will become a growing problem. I'd like to quickly get into four areas that are, um, I guess I'd call them two-party issues, 
And these are where both parties involved play a role in ensuring traffic safety in regards to both parties' safety. One, pedestrians. Pedestrians are key because seeing that no one here is in a wheelchair, we're all pedestrians at one point in time. Every day. Right now, I'm a pedestrian, technically. Pedestrian crashes, there aren't that many of them, <coughs> frankly. They're about 1%, a little over 1% of all crashes in the region. But on average, they're one of six in terms of fatalities. One of six people out there are pedestrians who die on our roads every year. In regards to injuries, up about 90% have some level of injury. And I'm talking about, be it a fatality, incapacitating, non-incapacitating, or you're hit and it's reported that you know, they get up and you know, they feel some pain in their neck. Odds are, if you are hit by a car as a pedestrian, you will get injured. You have no protection. It's just you and the car. 4,000 pounds versus 180. Do the physics. It doesn't work in the pedestrian's favor. In regards to the things, I mean, it's a two-part problem. Of course, motorists, we need to realize that pedestrians have the right way at, at crosswalks. And that all intersections are technically crosswalks. That is in the law. We have to be more careful in the school zones. And especially extra care in backing down driveways, especially as our cars get bigger and higher. And if we don't have backup cameras, there's a bigger chance of backing into somebody as we come down our driveways. And as for pedestrians, they have to play a part too. Don't darn in the street. It's just something that, um, you know, you have the right of way, but even the law says that don't make it such that, that you put yourself potentially in a situation where you could potentially cause a crash because you just started into the street. Yes, sir? It's, it's true, and also, if you are a pedestrian and a bike or a bicyclist, you are ever in an incident with a car, get a law enforcement officer to the scene to write up an official report because there are incidents that don't necessarily get reported. They just don't. You don't report the incidents, it's not in the data set, and there isn't a problem necessarily. Bicycles, it's a similar situation. Bicycle crashes, it's maybe about half, of a half a percent of all crashes. Somewhat understandably so, just because there are frankly not a lot of bicycle riders in this town. Um, but it's a similar situation. It, you still have the same level of vulnerability because even with your bike, you have no protection. The only protection you might have is a helmet on your head that's made out of hopefully some quality styrofoam. Odds are there's going to be an injury involved. Over 95%, it will involve some level of injury. On average, it's about maybe about 50, 55%. You'll have a serious injury, fatality, uh, incapacitating injury, non-incapacitating injury. It's just it's crit it's it's a it's an unfortunate situation, but again, it's a matter of physics. It's still the 4,000 uh, pound car versus the 200 pound bicyclist and bike. Although I'm sure you have a far lighter bike than I do. And this is, here's an issue here. Of the incidents that have been captured, you know, at least two thirds, at least two thirds of bicyclists were not wearing a helmet. And if you look at the first two bars, especially, these are younger people who should be always wearing a helmet. I believe the city of Houston law is if you are under 18, you are required to wear a helmet. Is it 16? 16? Three out of four or not? It's a similar situation with motors and bicyclists as with pedestrians. Bikes has the same exact rights as motorists on, on the road. And that we should be keeping an eye on it. Because we don't. We really don't. Because we're 
on the whole more concerned about the car ahead of us, car behind us, the car to the side of us. We don't think about the bike because we don't see the bike that often, but we should always be cognizant for bikes and give at least three feet. And when we're dealing with parked cars on the side, give a little more because the bicyclist is gonna be right smack in the middle of that lane because they don't wanna get hit by a car that uh, decides to open the door right when the bicyclist is passing by. Um, and just, you need some patience in dealing with bicyclists. They're not as fast, it's true, but there needs to be some patience. And for bicyclists, there's also rules there that bicyclists have to follow all the rules of the road. Um, and that they should be cognizant of traffic. There's a lot of traffic behind the bicycle. Reconsider your routing, perhaps. You know, if there's a lot behind you, perhaps, you know, if there's a side street adjacent that can help, you know, get you there a little faster where you're not impeding traffic, use it because it's not just, it, it's for your safety as well. Because unfortunately, is what I call poking the bear, is that while much of us might be patient, there are some people who are not patient with bicyclists and like to express their lack of patience with a bicyclist. So for, their, for your safety as well, just be cognizant of the traffic situation. Motorcyclists, it's also a two-party two situation. Motorcyclists, it's relatively level, but on the whole, motorcycle crashes have been going up. And this is more of a national trend. Um, regionally, there was a bit of a downturn. Uh, it's suspected that you know, motorcycling is also kind of a recreational pastime in bad economic times. Perhaps fewer people are riding motorcycles as in, as in better times. Motorcycle fat fatalities though, it's about one in seven involve motorcyclists. Motorcyclists are a lot more challenged too just because um, they, don't ha they have about equal protection as a bicyclist, plus you have a 400 pound machine under you and that uh, it could crush you as well as the car that might plow into you could crush you. So this is a serious issue for motorcyclists and uh, Harris County is one of the biggest places for motorcycle incidents. I-45 through Harris County, most number of motorcycle crashes in the state. A lot of, there's a huge chance for serious injury. Um, considering the speeds you're going at, if you're going 60 miles per hour and all of a sudden you're thrown from your bike, even if you're wearing your helmet, you can get some serious injury. About 60%, 60 percent, 60 percent of crashes involve some level of serious injury. Because even if you're wearing a helmet, if you're not dressed appropriately, and you go sliding down the street, you can do terrible damage to your body. Motorcycle usage, uh, helmet usage, it's a real mixed bag. You know, the law says you don't have to wear one if you have certain insurance. But what I want you to look at is, of the folks killed, 56% were not wearing a helmet. In regards to where the, where sharing the road comes to play, got four wheelers versus the two wheelers. Cars, always be cognizant of your surrounding vehicles, especially motorcycles. And give space behind a motorcycle because they stop quicker. And if something goes wrong with a the motorcycle, they have a bigger chance of, of, of hitting, the, hitting the ground and dropping their bike. And you have, you have to be a far quicker in terms of your reflexes in dealing with that. Sometimes they may appear like they're being a bit of a jerk because they'll swerve in the lane. They're avoiding obstacles half the time because what we might be able to run over, they can't run over it because it might cause them to drop their bike. So be, be cognizant about that. Also, one other thing, if you ever see a motorcycle that has its turn signal just going and it's not going anywhere, just be patient with it. Just because, with a car, it will self-correct. With a motorcycle, it doesn't self-correct all the time. So they're not necessarily turning. Just be patient with that. But in regards to motorcyclists, wear appropriate clothing. I know it's hot sometimes in Texas, uh, but if you're not wearing leather and you're just wearing your skin, um, you hit the ground and you skid across a, a concrete at 50 miles an hour, you personally skidding across the concrete at 50 miles an hour, um, the amount of damage you'll merely do to your skin is excessive. I mean, if, you, if you're into skin grafts, try dressing inappropriately for a motorcycle. Get basic rider training. A lot of people don't go through basic rider training. 
but it's, it's really important to do. In fact, if you are getting a motorcycle license and you don't have one now, it is required you get basic rider training. Avoid blind spots around cars because they're not watching out for you necessarily and they don't need to run into you. And obey the speed limits and the traffic laws because Lord knows there are a lot of bikers out there who love to just hit that throttle and you know, go cut in and out of, of drivers. First, it's dangerous for them. Two, you're not doing yourselves any favors in regards to what drivers think of, four wheelers think of you. The last thing I want to deal with is large vehicle crashes. I'll do this real quick because we're, I think, beyond time. We have a big port here. We have a lot of trucks driving through here, um, which means a lot of, a lot of uh, cargo and big trucks weighing 60, 80,000 pounds going down our highway. Um, this is big because you impact against a four-wheeler versus an 18-wheeler. 18 18-wheeler 18 wins pretty much every time. Um, in terms of the trends here, there's a downtrend you know, that has gone through 2000. It's back on the upswing. This could be a sign of the economy. We're going to have to keep our eyes on these trends. The thing about commercial vehicle crashes, if you look, these bars are all divided about in half. That's because half the problem is usually the truck driver, and half of it's the rest of us. Truck driving companies are really big on safety. They have to because it's their vehicle, it's their property, it's the cargo, they are responsible for it. And so they really promote a culture of safety in, in the trucking industry. But it's the rest of us, how we deal with traffic, that's part of the issue. One, stay out of the no zone. You see the red spots here? These are the spots where the trucks can't necessarily see you. And they're gonna come plowing in, they're gonna turn right into you potentially, they can't see you. They can't see out their mirrors. You see a sign, can't see, your, see my mirrors, I can't see you. There's truth to that. If you're going to be around a truck, you have to be in a spot where they can actually see you. I don't know how, you, how many of you are into drafting for good gas mileage. I'll tell you, in my little car, uh, I can get behind a truck and I can pull 70 miles per gallon doing 7 miles per hour. I do not recommend that, and I don't do it. It's just something I, I was just curious to see what happens. It isn't worth it because those trucks can stop rather quickly, and you can go flying right into that truck because they have better braking power than your car, believe it or not. Whatever you do, do not cut off a truck because you could cut it off. If you have to stop suddenly, that truck come plowing into you. Right out here, Timmons at 59, I just happened to be looking out the window one day and I saw a stalled Ford Festiva on the freeway. I was having a conversation, I saw an 18 wheel smash right into the back of it. And the windshield just flew right across the freeway. It was one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. I'm not saying that individual cut them off, but I could see what a truck can do when it runs into the back of a car. And I don't care what safety devices have been built into your car, it cannot withstand 60,000 pounds coming at you at 60 miles an hour. The final issue I want to get into is unrestrained passengers. And of course, I have to do, use a little kid in the picture because a lot of this is about our kids. You know, we're all grown ups, we can all make our own decisions. Unrestrained passengers, we have a downward trend. This is good. We're wearing our belts more than we, you know, than folks know. Um, of crashes in the area, believe it or not, of all the crashes that I have, three percent on average, where people listed as not wearing their belts, and that's great compared to what it used to be. That's excellent. The problem I have though is the first two columns where there are almost 15,000 kids under the age of 16 who are not wearing a seat belt. The one I'm most concerned about though is the 4,833 that are under eight. As parents, we are responsible for our children. Um, they do not necessarily, maybe are not terribly able to bu bu buckle themselves. If those kids are not buckled, that's all on us. And it's their deaths that are essentially, you know, you know, ideally we want all of our kids to stay buckled, and this is the law, we all have to be buckled. But there are far too many kids who are being, who are being found without seat belts on. And that is truly an issue, despite all the messaging that goes out. 
and there are a lot of injuries out there. Um, thankfully, um, as I mentioned, so many people are wearing the belts that it is not as big of a, you know, a problem as it used to be, but still one out of four crashes, fatalities, someone was not wearing their seat belts. And that's what our fatality situation looks like in regards to the region. We still have 60, peop 60 people under the age of 16 who've died over the last seven years because they weren't wearing a seat belt. It just shouldn't happen. You know, we, we put our own lives in our own hands, but our kids, that's something where we have to take extra special caution. In regards to the future of traffic safety, a lot of this is about us and our behavior and what we choose to do, choose not to do, and how we behave. Now, granted, in the future, things might look a little different. We're going to be driving around with yellow circles surrounding our cars, according to this picture. What this picture is actually trying to tell us is that the technology, and this is something which is not like a Jules Verne story. This is more an issue of the future is cars are going to be potentially talking to other cars, and cars are going to be talking to the road. The road is going to be talking back to the cars. And because of this, we're going to be, the cars are going to be talking in such a way that if it is deemed that we, one car thinks it's going to hit another car, it will start slowing down on its own. If a car is going a certain speed and it's, it, the light tells them I'm about to change to yellow in three seconds, it's going to tell the car, slow down, light's about to change three seconds. This future is closer than we think. The major auto companies are already working on the technology for this. This could be maybe 15, 20 years down the road. And this is a lot what's what we take the human error out of the traffic situation. That's going to have a big improvement on traffic safety. I want some concluding thoughts before we wrap up here. One, we do need to continue keeping an eye on our tr crash trends. As you see, the data shows a decline and then an increase. I don't know if, again, this could be a temporary thing to the economy. It could be an issue of the amount of traffic. And it could be, frankly, just a data issue that what we got here is that there's better reporting. If the reporting is truly getting better, we should see a leveling off of, of crashes. But we have to keep an eye on these trends because we're going to be somewhat more responsible for it. We have to keep looking at the various, the engineering, the education, the enforcement, and the emergency management in terms of dealing with these issues. And it has to be across the board. It can't be a matter of putting X amount, you know, 80% into this pot and then throw some change towards these other issues. It has to be across the board because, again, the engineering fix is not going to necessarily f stop drunk drivers from driving drunk. And the enforcement fix is not going to necessarily prevent the pedestrians from getting hit on, on the roadway. So it's going to be coordinated. And the policy makers are going to have to make, are going to have to be making some decisions because it's looking like there may be more responsibility put on our region to ensure traffic safety. Um, you know, I could tell you to share the road, get off the phone, don't drink and drive. The messaging will always be the same. We just all have to continue to do it. Because ultimately, crashes, they're all, they're, on the whole, are avoidable. We don't have to run a red light. We don't have to speed. We don't have to drink and drive. We can wear our seat belts. We can wear a helmet if we're on our bikes. We can cross at the right time. But it's about us making proper choices. On that note, and looking at the time, I will take any questions. Yes, sir. Do you have data on the uh, number of fatalities that are freeway related as opposed to the ones that are non freeway related? specifically on any area because I mean I could tell you that um, about at least in regards to pedestrians because you know pedestrians is a big issue about sure. one in four pedestrian fatalities is on the freeway and what we're trying to figure out in fact there is a work group we're trying to figure out whether or not it's people who are stalled on the freeway and trying to get out of their cars because they're stalled never get out of your car because you're actually safe in your car if you're stalled or if they're call it doing what I call drunk frogger because there there have been instances where it's someone literally trying to cross the freeway to get to the other side because it's the fastest option. What about free, uh, vehicle versus vehicle? 
I'm going to have to do some more research on that. Freeway crashes are a little challenging to discern, but um, I'm going to have to go through and look to see where exactly those will lie because I have to separate at times crashes that they say are on the freeway, they're actually on the frontage road. It takes a lot of uh, refinement of the data. Yes, that's, you know, that was something I was taught and I've learned that uh, an accident is what my four-year-old does, you know, sometimes when he can't make it to the bathroom. But a crash, that's, that's what occurs because they're not accidents. Accidents are, I mean, these are completely avoidable. Any other questions? Um, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate that uh, you stuck around to the end. Uh, this probably could have been a good three hour presentation. Uh, there's a lot of, sub of subjects to cover in this because traffic safety is a multifaceted topic. And uh, I thank you for your time and thank you for your attendance.